the BSC in uh, 2004 um, honoured Anthony by uh, asking him to become a BSC member well before um, he got an Oscar, well before he got BAFTAs, well before any of these accolades. And he's been so busy, he's never been able to collect his certificate. So it's going to be great, great pleasure in giving him from 2004 the Look certificate that. that he's oh. got in the first place. From a member. That's fantastic. I'm a member. Yeah, you're fully. Uh, I was going to say that. This is actually the first time, and I wanted to thank everybody in me, because it is the first time I've sat here with a collection of. Well, the BSC, it's you know, the first time. Uh, and you've been it's very supportive, and I love that. And thank you so it's much. It's um, wow. And the other thing is that I've just heard is that you've also been asked to be a member of the ASC <laughs> as well. So congratulations on that. So you've got Denmark, England, and yeah, you've covered the world, really. You've virtually covered the world. That's getting embarrassing. So it's very nice to see everybody here. Thank you for coming. And uh, it's great to see directors, uh, uh, producers, editors, everybody here. And in the spirit of collaboration, we have Antti Don Mantle here and also Thomas Neveld. If I, the, no, not quite right. Yeah, yeah it's fine. <laughs> it's pretty fine. good. Uh, and who is his gaffer and has been his gaffer for many, many years. Um, the, I mean, I think the first, what I quite like to ask is, let's see, in the last five films you've done, um, The Eagle, uh, 127 Hours, Antichrist, Slumdog Millionaire, and th these are the last four uh, of many, um, 44 films that you've made. Goodness me. Um, where did it all come from? I mean, were you, did you come up, uh, is, was your background one, a creative background? Did you, were you brought up as uh, going to art school or going to, um, I know you went to film school, but did you, was it a creative background that you came from or did it just come later on in life? And it came late. Uh, I, it's a, I, briefly, because I can go on for hours, but I, it came late. I had a creative family. My mum was a painter and is a painter. Not a brilliant painter, she's a painter. Uh, and I, I was surrounded all my childhood by canvases and colours and stuff like that. <coughs> Dad was more into chemicals and uh, fertilisers. But, you know, there's a chemical scientist in photography. Mm -hmm. uh, just about, still. Kodak, it's on it. And um, thank God for that. Uh, so I came through a kind, of, kind of an arty home, a free home. Uh, I wasn't pushed too hard academically or anything. Uh, the last time my dad tried to push me to do anything was to be a choir boy and that didn't work and since then it, I haven't done well, he didn't push me since mm -hmm. then so that was a different note but uh, I started but it's your dabbling it shows it that it shows, it it shows that creativity it shows that yeah, experimentation it shows that pushing um, images and storytelling through m m m images it comes from it come, I came from stills I, my first teachers in uh, in London were people like Don McCullin uh, I remember you know, documentary, British social conscience, tradition, mm. stills, uh, me with my middle class, protected home, uh, went to Windia quite early on in my development. They were my, they were my first photographs and that kind of shock of seeing something not, you could, you could go down, you could go down, you know, the road from Greenwich to New Cross and see something or wherever mm -hmm. you can see, you can see things everywhere that remind you that you're privileged. but. But I've always tended to sort of, <clears throat> maybe because I'm middle class, I've always tended to look at the people less privileged and think about that than look at the people the more privileged, which mm. will make me totally un unhappy. Mm, mm, and mm, looking mm, at people mm. less privileged also makes me unhappy, but it, I can do something about that concern. And I think that forced me, together with my artistic background and maybe sensibility, that, which I hadn't developed mm. until quite late, 24, 25, um, that combined with my early training, which was in stills, where I looked at really... I really looked at Stills' work from documentary tr tradition. Mm. And then I went to India, as I said, and spent a year there. And anything I looked at there was devastatingly emotionally disturbing. And it made, just made me feel extremely privileged again. It's about that. So let's talk a bit about the eagle here. Um, I've done just two, uh, <coughs> three films recently, which have all been period. Um, one was before my time, but the other two was during my time. And so what approach do you take when you want to make a film of a period that you've got 
no idea about that one there. Uh, and and how do you how do you approach that? And where, you know how do you how accurate are you? I mean, did those guys have any little skulls on their heads? I mean, was, was that? Oh, was you it, mean the ones here? Uh, the ones on the on the top. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, let's be. I mean, yeah. quite simply, the main enemy for us. Well, it's not an enemy. But it's a challenge. It's the. Uh, it's a naturalistic light factor. I mean, they didn't have they had candles, and that's it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in some of the some of the design, there were less windows than we could have done with. So you get in there early and do things like that. I mean, you you know, I I sort of don't study period films or Roman films because I had to do this. But I looked at the mood boards. I talked very closely with my designer and with Thomas very closely in prep. We look at things like simply fundamental things like how much window space there is, how tall the walls. Are we going to be top lighting a lot and supplementing with side light, which I like to do? Mm -hmm. um, how do we get the film? It's also entirely shot on film, which is unusual for me. There's a few, there's about 10 or 15 DSLR jabs in there in the battle scenes and a few other scenes. I only really spot them. They are noticeable if you analyze the film, but mm. otherwise it's pure, it's pure analog DI in, in London. But I pushed everything. I tried to, my early experience, uh, 10 years ago on 16, I shot a film called Mifune which I shot, I was forced to shoot uh, pretty much on available light because it was one of those dogma films. I didn't cheat much on that one either, uh, apart from the director standing with a white dressing gown just very close to the side of the face of the actor. So I'm just sticking a bit of fill in. Yeah, yeah, but uh, that's it, I shot that on 16 and I shot it, uh, I certainly shot it on Kodak, but I pushed the stock to around about 1,000, which is pretty rough going, rough going for 16 more legs, you know, for our house projection. But I did that because I thought I started to see effects that I was seeing with my own eyes that the film was beginning to capture. I don't think there's a law about this, but I kind of worked my way around to the assessment that somewhere around about 1,000, 800 to 1,000 ESA, my film stock was beginning to break. capture. It was certainly beginning to break up yeah. then. <laughs> You're absolutely right. But it was also <laughs> beginning to capture uh, and register. Mm -hmm. elements of light movement like curtains and stuff like that you know the, the low end of the scale right but i thought okay this is roughly and this was leave. before this is way back for me you know, for 500 uh, asa or anything yeah it was, it was yeah i can't remember what i pushed i'm trying to remember i shot and i think a lot of it was actually on 250 which i pushed to five and mm. then pushed further it was mm -hmm. pretty messy and there was a lot of grain but that was the nature of that that period with the dogma films and it was the only one i sh shot on film but i remember that and things have changed and things do develop as we know because of film stocks so far superior mm, today mm. but that said because of taste and because it was a period film and because I associated this period of our history rather more with a texture that I kind of associate a little bit more with painting mm, uh, mm. the way the light falls away so you lack of detail paintings, I look painters? at paintings I always look at paintings because I like looking at paintings mm -hmm. uh, I try not to look at too many films because I tend to get led off and mm. get repetitive but, but I look at paintings, I look at textures, and I talk a lot with the director, with Thomas, with, with the designer, Michael Carlin, about that. And you find a palette, and then you find that there are films that actually mm. have been there before, or there were, and you find often, often things like Tarkovsky, and there are mm. many examples of that where you, the painterly films, there are some good examples of that. But I wanted to, I wouldn't say annihilate, because I've got Kodak in the house, but I wanted to adjust the kind of fine grain resolution and brilliant definition of what was all 35. 35 millimeter stock on this film by pushing. So pushing. I pushed everything. I pushed everything from the 50. And you underexposed a lot as well. You did That's the next bit. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> push I push uh, everything one to one and a half and uh, by agreement with the labs. Um, and then I underexposed further depending on what the stock is. It was all Kodak. I shot a little bit of Fuji, the 400, but it's 98%, 90%. I'm not saying it because you're in the house, guys, wherever you are. But, uh, uh, I felt safe with the Kodak stuff and mm -hmm. the, the material. And I was kind of gobsmacked how well behaved it is and how mm. robust it is, even under those conditions. And Thomas, I think we pushed everything. And uh, I think we did as well, yeah. And I kind of, uh, I, I first yeah. did in my tests, which was we're in Budapest. Uh, we we tested. It doesn't quite seem very grainy either. I mean, well, it's it not really, is no. there? And when you are in particularly tough places where it's been lifted a little bit here, where the old Kevin's been in, I think. Mm. I wasn't there, but it's been like slipped up a bit in mm -hmm. a couple of places. I can just see it beginning to bubble. And it's not because I wanted that grain. He loves grain. It wasn't because I wanted grain. It was because I wanted to then go into the DI afterwards and take that slight noisy area of detail. And I wanted to then fudge that and soften it and noise reduce it, which I love mm -hmm. doing. And then I really go to work in the post, in the DI, because I adore the DI. 
even more than I do enjoy shooting. Mm. I really enjoy the DI. Uh, so it was a combination of that working in our testing, doing what we could purely analog, and then going back to Adam, who was grading this film in uh, 142. Was it, is it 142 a cent? Yeah. 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 140, is it? 140. Uh, he then said, Well, I think, you know, Anthony, we can do a lot of this without you having to push too much. I wasn't sure about that, but I certainly think we can do a lot of this in the DI. So I'd shot. I was cross-processing. I shot the scene in the in the seal village in the house that hut just before they go outside with the flames, the mm. flames, and go down the hill to that ritual. All that scene inside that hut shot through the back of the neck. I've done that before in, on sixty. My shot. It's very difficult with the film where you've got studio money involved, but I shot that through the back of the neck. So I re-rolled it and shot it five times over exposed. It was quite a. a Again, shocked at how it behaved because five times. Yeah, and I've done this in sixteen, and then graded and pushed the colours to get this kind of weird halation, and it's right. beginning to tear it apart. Right. It's not, I don't recommend doing whole thing like that. Beautiful, beautiful landscapes. <laughs> what an amazing country. Uh, well, I was Gamery Marsh with you uh, this year. Um, Vima Sigmund, uh, Sigmund oh, yeah. uh, I spoke to and um, asked him about the deer hunter. And uh, that wonderful scene where Robert De Niro goes up the mountain um, and yeah. uh, with the gun, yeah. and the landscape is amazing. There's this beautiful uh, um, low cloud, and there's in fact, orchestral music. And you know, it makes the film, it yeah. sort of describes what the film's about, really. And um, I asked him, Well, how long, how long uh, uh, did you just turn up and it just happened to be absolutely perfect, or, or did you wait? And he waited three weeks Good for this perfect weather. <laughs> I mean, any more of that. Are there any producers? And, but, I mean, in your case, I mean, the beautiful landscapes, I mean, did you, is it, did you have any time to wait? Could you hang hang about for that lovely sunset and the lovely If you wait, the, light? Continuity, the continuity changes so much. You have <laughs> like that, like that, like that, all the time in it's Scotland. Robbie it never Muller. happens anymore. <laughs> never happens anymore <laughs> no. on any film. So that's... No. I don't I, we, I've never... No. Been there where well, it's happened. Anyway. Well, no, nor have I. And no. it's different I'm, now. I mean, our, our pace is different. You just have to yeah. do it. And also, also stocks and our image capture systems are there's more tolerance. There is more tolerance, mm -hmm. but we have adjusted. And also, continuity is a, is a, a variable, isn't it? Con mm. The whole concept of continuity is, is something that adjusts itself according to aesthetics and mm. audiences. But I mean, uh, I remember Vittorio Strauss, his story of holding a crew. You know, and serving pasta with his family and talking about scarves for three weeks before the weather was right. I've heard these stories too. <laughs> Lars von Trier, uh, you know, Thomas uh, Winterberg, Kevin McDonnell and Danny Boyle. Yeah. I mean, all very <coughs> different people. Certainly. So, they should work together. But you, do you stay the same? And you, uh, uh, or do you have to adapt completely, change the way that you work with them or talk oh, to them you? or? Or they have their different strengths, and I mean, Danny's got a huge amount of energy, and he, you know, yeah. he never stops. He's just like, Dan, Danny's uh, the director I go huge. in the latest. If I, if I had to go into a film late, with which often happens with less prep than we all need or mm. ideally feel we deserve together, uh, Danny's the one I go in latest. I, I Lars is always prepared. I don't work with Lars anymore, but we've been there and achieved that. <laughs> That's definitely over. But uh, he's always quite clear about what he wants. But he's changed over the last five or six years. Uh, so you become more very very fundamental to mm. executing it and that's prep and in the last two films that I've done with last he was like walking out the door really at one in the afternoon and it was difficult uh, Danny's always there first one to arrive in the morning and the last one to leave and, and it constantly changes during the day you you have different ideas oh that sounds like a better idea oh, that's swap as far as shooting the, yeah. shooting da, da, uh, certainly or on was it all pretty fixed uh, da, da, Danny will is experienced enough to know that certain scenes, because of again stunts or or multi cameras mm. or mm. getting something done in the time, mm. like Slumber was complicated because someone's moving on quickly. Um, he knows that there's a value to doing that. But however much I storyboard with him and with the directors I like working best with, who I storyboard occasionally with, I love it if there's a little feeling like a a, a mental space of ten percent and energy. To say well, we can change this if you need to, and it's a well, good. Well, because accidents can be important. Yeah, and you have to, well, sometimes out yeah, of accidents, yeah. I'm not, or I'm something not, that goes wrong, actually, yeah. it gets better. And I'm not. I'm best at that way than I am yeah. the plan, the kind of militia way. Um, and Danny's a very. He's a, He's very visual. He's a star. I mean, all his films have been very stylish, haven't they? Yeah. So he he puts a slant, a visual slant, in it. That's helpful for a DP too. He brings half the rainforest in the yeah, and yeah, photographs yeah. too. If you wouldn't prep, he literally walks in a room. 
which is already covered. All the walls are covered, and his house. I'm in his house now, and it's like a. Mm. It's all the films come back to because they're pictures everywhere. It's amazing. Mm. Really, he's a very visual, driven person, isn't he? I think the new technology that we've got um, nowadays uh, has obviously changed our approach to filmmaking and image making. Uh, whereas I remember when I started off, you know, uh, for for films on film, and I haven't done a video uh, film yet, but uh, but you know it was very important to get the lenses to, to to match up so that it was better for the grading. In a way, now with a new technology, you sort of want lenses that don't match. You want to have <laughs> imperfection in a way. You want to have things because the image is so sharp, uh, uh, often that you want to break that up. You want to do different things. You want to do different things with when images. You mean, match, you mean that if the if the stocks are pushing, well, you want to make sublime, make an image you want not necessarily yeah. super sharp. Oh yeah. You um, want to make it soft. So you're changing the approach. You're being more poetic with your images because. You're able to be, and you you want it to be different from everybody else's way of doing things. Is that not true? But uh, beforehand in film, you know, there was a sort of a logical way of doing things, and there was a way that everybody did a thing. Now we can mix them and match, and you do that more than anybody. You or know, you do, you know, yeah. for instance, 127 hours, <laughs> it looks like color Xerox. You found a way of shooting with a, this video that could never have been done on film, could never look like that on film, but you found a way, a poetic way, of changing it and th being different. I think I've always tended towards that. I think you mentioned something earlier about a creative background, whatever. Mm. I think when I think about it now, it always seems to come to mind. I'm sick in situations like this where I'm thinking out loud. But I think I became more uh, certainly confident in my direction about what I wanted to, to uh, work with, um, not I don't mean quick equipment, but the kind of ideas and the concepts and the sort of the visual worlds I wanted to work with, I became more clear about uh, expression and my kind of palette, which is not my own kind, but palette um, aesthetics before I became more proficient, which I am now because it says here. Uh, b before I before I came more be as well. yeah, before I became more proficient and you can back this up I think uh, before I became more proficient in actually what is for us a very very complicated and long long lasting training it never stops really uh, as far as photochemistry was concerned mm. when I was learning I'm classically trained through photography and then cinematography and then as I started to come out of film school under during film school the video formats really were starting to move so. I, I'm, what I'm saying is aesthetically, I was more attracted to different aesthetics, which is maybe more uh, a fine art way of thinking. I think it is. And, it's and a, I came it's from the school right with Curtis. Well, when we were in that school, Curtis, in London, there was, a, there was a pure cinematography stream, there was a pure photography stream, and there were the funny ones in the middle, of which you were one of them, and I was well. And that was a very short-lived period of something called Centre Stream, which very soon probably made itself bankrupt and was stopped and disbanded and never happened. We were happened. very lucky. Yeah. We were very lucky. And we had this fine art. There were poets and there were performance artists. Do you remember that? And that is before... And I kind of took that energy and that idea and that openness mm. over to the National Film School in Copenhagen, which is really much very similar mm. to Milan. Beaconsfield is. It's a, it's a traditional establishment where you've got good teachers and good periods and less good periods, but you it's a training and it's a vocation and it's a serious uh, discipline. And so I'm, one of the things I think my which is still happening, correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm getting there. <laughs> I've learned a lot from this guy uh, and with the people, and I came into quite, for me, in my beginning of my career, quite large projects, not massive studio projects, but films, feature films. When I were, I, Jan was at school with me as well. I was less proficient than you, for example, in traditional, the disciplines of lighting and the language and the innuendo of Well, you always give me that impression. Anyway. Yeah, I, I know you say that I, anyway. <laughs> and I think I saw... I, I, I fed you my, up. And I asked you sort of about the video uh, mm. and, you know, how, and you made it quite clear that that's not how you work. I had a headache, John. I had a headache. To, I didn't want to talk you about want, it. You want, it's, it's about the image. You want to create an image and how you find out how to do it. That's what you, you see. You, yeah. you, you test it and figure it out. Well, I've, I've worked, Danny, you think Danny, I mean, when we did 28 Days Later, which became a radical cinema at the time, it was a mm. zombie flip, it was shot no, on the XLs, amazing, the cannons. I mean, that actually wasn't my decision. It was, um, I came over there and the first thing he said to me was we were going to close down London for 10 days. So I was thinking, get the bloody film cameras out, you know, get, mm, the, mm. get the lorries out because you can't do that. It's going to be history and mm. you'll get away with that once. 
And then we were doing these tests and the designer, Mark Tilsley, um, and, and Danny had done a lot of tests without me on the Excels. And then I was involved in them. And I was looking at the results. And I agree that what I liked most of all those horrendous formats at the time was the Canon. And ironically, I remember as far as specs were concerned and what should be the best, that wasn't the best one. But we just looked at that, mm. projected it in Leicester mm. Square. And we thought, well, that's what we like the look of. So we would mm. sit there with, you know, you've got a designer. Thomas was probably there. Uh, Danny and some other people, and Andrew McDonald, the financiers, and they said, okay, if that's what you like and we think it's all right, let's go that way. And then you, then you just lock in. Yeah. And then, then for that film, where we did close down London, and you do horrendously historic things that won't happen again, maybe, you're shooting on these then well, quite I mean, consumer that, that things. Scene, uh, I was horrified. Oh, square, also, and still, yeah, 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 and I, I still see it. I think I have, a little, it's a, I have a little bit of a shake about it. But that was actually Danny. So it's not just some... Mad had a cinematographer or cinematographers forcing that way. There are directors and there are, and we're in a whole gen generation today because mm. so many people in these audiences today, and the younger kids I often talk to around the mm -hmm. world, they are looking at so many formats. Mm. And, and my kids mm. are making things and uploading on YouTube. And mm. I'm, I'm not saying that's bad. We can still we still have to do the stories the best we can. And there's always a right way and a wrong way to do a story. Mm -hmm. and that's our jobs to ascertain. Dogma. I mean, uh, how, what did that teach you? If, if anything. If you start writing 10 rules down on the lavager seat and you've been there too long, mm. flush and get out quickly. Um, but did it at all? I mean, has it influenced yeah. you? Has it? Of course it has, because it's affected my life. And uh, it was at the time for me, certainly uh, talking of Vilmos, a big, for my first visit to America, to Palm Springs Festival, in front of a lot of Hollywood people, a lot of great DOPs, Conrad Hall was there. Vilmos was there, and Vilmos got up in front of the whole damn place, loved Vilmos, and said, why do you make films without light? You know, and this is my first arrival in Hollywood. I was really nervous. I was, I was old enough to be strong, but I, I came there with my little PC3 cam, and we shot Celebration, and it was a five-week escapade without Thomas. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, as you know, just what it was. And he, he went at me hammer and tongs, and Conrad didn't. Conrad was a very loving, and we had a real Barney, me and Vilmos, for a while. It's, it's all over now. But... Uh, I lost the thread. What was I talking? You asked me about. Well, what, what dogma did for yeah, you? Yeah, I mean, basically, what it, what I was doing then was just not taking the life of the shell, uh, the lights of the shells, because I couldn't do it. So I had to look for the light, mm -hmm. and it's, it was an interesting task for five weeks of my life and development to sort of take a director and a small crew around and say, well, I think we were going to do it here, but I think we're going to have to do it here because you can see which way the sun's going, mm. you can see what's happening over the skies, you can see what's happening. Look at that color; we've never seen that before. Mm. Uh, Work like that. And yeah. Sometimes it works against you, and you get caught or you get stuck, and that was and, the nature of the film. And how often did you break the rules? You know, when oh, you're not very much. There's one lovely still in in celebration where they're about to have a have a little rut in the bed, and they're arguing before they go down for mm. the dinner. And there's that the main character looking for socks, and she's left his socks at home and having an argument. And and I'm trying to do this shot from high up in the room and come down into their faces, and I try and try and try. And, even though it should be could be loose and free and I, mean, mm. I just couldn't quite get it right so I stuck it on the boom the boom pole and gaffered it onto the boom pole so it was still a handheld boom and I was just going like this and I went came down and I remember Thomas looking horrified in the door because he was a diligent you know non-rule breaker but it was the only time I really broke it and funnily enough as I come down and get the camera into the face of these two or her lying in bed uh, the camera just whips through a reflection in a mirror on the wardrobe cupboard if you sort of go frame by frame through there's a lovely picture of me with my funny hat on and this camera on this pole, cemented for life, and oh a cheater. It's just quite funny, really. mm. but that, those those dog films were about if you had to cheat. They were not about cheating on you. They were about why we do the things to do. Why you go into autopilot after three or four films very quickly as a proficient professional get caught in mm. habits that actually are not always artistically or emotionally interesting in the long run. You mm. have to catch mm. yourself out and think. It's like a director coming and tweaking you and saying, mm. "Let's try and do this new." Sometimes present it, but you. Oh, sometimes fine. Okay, mm. that led me into somewhere different. We tend as professionals to slip very quickly into not something uniform, but a, a pattern that suits us best, which also sometimes is greatly appreciated because we're quick mm. and efficient. But sometimes it becomes the life falls out of your language, yes. and you sense the film too quickly up there, and you know where it's going, and just keeps going there. Mm. I think that was interesting to be forced to think differently, and it wasn't about one specific rule. It was just about thinking, oh, I can't do this because of that. Mm. So let's try and do something. So you're actually thinking on set. For some silly reason, the rules are written, but let's try and do it differently. Mm. That in itself is, is a healthy... And, uh, a few more, uh, very few more questions, because I want the audience to ask things. The, um, is there any, anybody that 
has influenced you or has made you the cinematographer, cinematographer that you are. I mean, I know that you worked on Breaking the Waves and Robbie Muller was there. Yeah. Um, he uh, seems to be have a, a certain something that might have influenced you. Oh, yeah. I don't know if, if there's anything that, that you feel strongly about that has made you the, the man you are. I love, I don't know what man I am, but I love Robbie because he was a poet and because he also knew a lot about life. He, he mm. And very simple as well, wasn't he? Yeah. Uh, yeah I yes. loved uh, Nick Rogue's films because I think some of the most intense inspirations we have are at that period in your life where you are learning most and that doesn't mm. go on and on. It's not as intense all the time. There's a period where I was actually in London with you, Kurt. Uh, so I'm, I'm into, I'm finding my direction. So I was like an open vessel. And you, I took in everything and sorted things very quickly when my brain was a lot healthier than it is today mm. and quicker. And I'm learning, so I just gather. Mm. And inevitably, I tend to think back to people like, actually Polanski, uh, who could take a camera apart, mm. put it back together. Mm. So Nick Rowe was a superb poet and filmmaker mm. and storyteller. Uh, I know my classics and they, they're great. Robbie was one of them because I, was, I suddenly was close to Robbie as I was learning more about film. I watched him working on Dance on the Dark and was interested in how it worked. And so you just finished uh, Dread, that's right? 3D? Uh, yeah. yeah um, Nightmare? What do you I think? The 3D there's a blur, it's blur, he's curling over the chair there. Michael, oh, yeah. he says he's now there's 600 effects shots. He's not editing. <laughs> he's in charge of the horror show of yeah. all the posts, all the images, okay. CG. But uh, it was a long haul. Thomas was there too. It was... Um, I have, if I was more organised, I would have pictures of you showing some of the machines. I'm not sure I can call them. They are cameras, but I shot most of it on the, on the on the reds. I had two or three red rigs, uh, the mirror rigs. I had SI two Ks in uh, in there as well for steady cam and for handheld. The handheld was, and I've done handheld for 25 years. I could not shoot that camera handheld. Mm -hmm. I just gave up. Incredibly heavy. And um, it's not about him. I just suddenly had a camera that had no ergonomics. It had no. I couldn't even find the middle of the frame. I've been mm -hmm. shooting mm -hmm. handheld for years. I couldn't. Um, I had uh, the Phantom with me a lot. I shot a lot of a lot of high speed, which is very exciting. Um, and we shot. What do you reckon, Michael? We shot about 80% of the film in, on set 3D. 85? Yeah, so we're up there, which is pleasing and sometimes less pleasing. 85% 3D? What, which, so, well, I mean... Uh, so on, on, some of it not 3D, you Well, some stuff you just have to. You've got flying shots and stuff like that. Some shots you just have to shoot 2D and convert, yeah. Oh, okay. But uh, we wanted, after a lot of debating backs and forwards and well into starting shooting, we wanted, soon we found, I wanted to really shoot as much as I possibly could in 3D and light and think in 3D and... I'd never done no, it. No, I didn't realise that. I thought they did. If it's a three D film, everything's three D. But okay. No, you get caught out. There were reasons why you can't. Yeah, yeah. Um, it was an extraordinary experience. But what I want to say was, I've got, I had cameras. I also, again, Stefan, the guy you mentioned before, who's I've been working with for ten years, on the camera side, who's trying to be, become a DP slowly himself. But he's a genius at HD supporting and stuff like that, workflows. He was with me in South Africa, and he helped me develop a camera that we used quite a lot with James Franco, which I call the fist cam, which mm -hmm. is this one here, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Uh, in the canyon. Uh, and I developed with him and some German guys a 3D camera with a mirror that I could actually hold like this. It doesn't mm -hmm. look like a camera. It, it, it looks like nothing on earth, but I could actually get that close. And that's never happened before, so I was very excited about that. Mm -hmm. And he helped me there again. It was impossible to light, Thomas. Yeah, and with back to all days, 125 so We <laughs> lit for all the time, so. Yeah, it was tough. Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, very yeah. tough, tough. I think 3D. I, I I won't know until we finish this film next year, Michael. Whether whether it's worth it. It's been worth it as an experience to go through. On Slumdog really, now there's a Steadicam guy on a skateboard. What's he's that a, about? He's a fantastic. <laughs> Slum. Uh, he's. A, I tried to get him last. I was in Mumbai last week, and I tried to get him back. But he's. He was shooting another film. He. He, he works, jumps on a skateboard. Works on a skateboard. Motorized mm -hmm. skateboard. Or on the set. He was the first guy I saw on a Segway. He was doing that. He was the first guy I'd saw one, but he was on a skateboard, and my focus puller, Telfer Barnes, was pulling on a skateboard too. So they're just whizzing around with his kids, and just got these two skateboards. It was just fantastic to see, you know, handheld go home when you can see guys doing that. But he was an extraordinary study cam, extraordinary. Okay, well I think you've answered all their questions. Nah, come on. Mm -hmm.